invite people to come to talk? Uh, yes, so I'm inviting everyone to please post your question uh, by clicking on this button at the very bottom of the screen, ask a question. And I am going to read them one by one. Uh, I can already see one question. So far? From Thomas Novotny. Yes, so far. Yeah. So, so he, he asks, Wolf, you mentioned in your talk that we would need new theory for the recurrent cortical networks you described. What would you like to get out of such a theory? Well, I think we, we would like to have a better description of what's going on in these recurrent networks because my gut feeling is that um, the inter interchange of activity cannot or signals cannot be really discretized every neuron being an analog computer in itself and um, the rate coupling um, perhaps just simulates an analog transmission of signals so perhaps we need to consider much more that these recurrent networks process like an analog computer. Um, I'm not sure, but this is an option I think we should talk about. Thomas, I invited you on the screen. Ah, now I can see somebody. That's great. Hello. <laughs> Hi, I'm Thomas. Yeah, I. Yeah, so I so I was wondering what was lacking in the dynamical systems models that we have of um, of recurrent neural networks. Yeah, I think the fact that we have to simulate them um, with the digital computers and have mm -hmm. to work with these three time steps. Um, the only way to really um, do justice to these networks would be to roll them out and into feedforward networks. But this would uh, be a very, very deep network, um, assuming that um, the time steps are not really discrete. And so I, I don't know how to tackle that problem with, with conventional methods. So I think something new is required. Um, I'm not a mathematician, unfortunately. So, <laughs> But to give us some impression, yeah, can I ask to give us some impression? Um, well, how long are the time scales you think one would need to consider? So how long is the memory in that dynamics that you would have to consider? The, the fading memory in, mm -hmm. in, well, we have these propagating waves that sweep over the network. We have this, uh, the sequences of um, acti sequential activation of the nodes, which take about, these sequences are about 100 to 150 milliseconds long. Um, also, these time constants, of course, are very um, much subject to, to modifications because these modulatory systems, they can mm -hmm. uh, change the dynamics of the recurrent network dramatically. They can mm -hmm. move it very close to criticality, in which case... Um, the, the, then the time scales would yeah, diverge, obviously. Yeah. They would mm -hmm. diverge or it would also uh, collapse to much shorter time scales if the excitability is low. Uh, in sleep, they probably have a very short memory span. All this is not explored, I think. Well, we're just starting to, to get the, the grips to it because what it requires is to record simultaneously for many nodes. Okay, that. Of course, the enormous problem of under damping. <clears throat> but we, we can now cope with it much better with the, with the voltage sensitive dice that can now be localized to the cell somata. Uh, Cartoonimity is a bit slow. There is a problem there, um, but um, I, also with the neural pixels probes, one can now get uh, 500, 600,000, 500, 600 neurons at the same time. So it's getting better. The understanding problem is probably resolvable to some extent. But uh, what should we do with these very high dimensional time series? This is my problem. We look at them, we don't see anything. We can't average them because uh, much of the information is contained in the, in the real-time relations between the activation of the nodes. Mm -hmm. And I think we need, we need something new. Um, okay, well, thank you very much. I think uh, there's a few more questions, so we can probably move on. Thank you okay. very much. Okay. So, 
Christian says, I am interested in the role of uh, acetylcholine might yeah. play in mediating attention and oscillations. Yes, yes, it, it certainly does. Uh, there's, there's literature describing that, for example, to get oscillations in the high frequency range, in the gamma range, uh, a certain amount of acetylcholine is, is absolutely necessary. Um, so one can stimulate the mesencephalic reticular formation, increase acetylcholine concentration in cortex, uh, some of which is not synaptically mediated, but is, um, is a parasynaptic release of acetylcholine. Uh, if one blocks um, acetylcholine receptors, um, one cannot induce any more high frequency coherent uh, oscillations. Um, so it's, it's, it's a necessary prerequisite to keep the cortex in a working range where all these interesting phenomena can, can take place. Thank you. Uh, Claudio has a question. I'm inviting you on the screen. It's, it's Claudio Mirazzo. I believe so. <laughs> Claudio, you are invited to the screen. Hi, Claudio. Hello, Wolf. How are you? Nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. Uh, I, I was very interested in the paper that you have with uh, Danko and, and Wolf and Wolf and Muscles when you recorded V1 activity. You were able to, to detect from the neuronal activity or to make a classifier that allowed you to distinguish whether the cat was in one letter or another. But uh, I wonder, how is, that is a kind of output layer that we interpret, but what about the brain? Does, does that kind of output layer exist anywhere? If it is a motor system, it seems to be obvious because then you have an action, that would be a kind of output layer, but what about when we just see something or recognize something? Do yeah. you think that is, a, is there any kind of output layer there? This is a great problem that uh, most of the evidence now is since everybody uses classifiers and these classifiers they always detect something and we of course ignore whether the brain is interested in what the classifier actually detects so the the only way would be to um, to have a have a behavior in addition and show that uh, behavior deteriorates at the same rate or for the same manipulation as the classifier deteriorates um, I think we have some indication from the evidence that I presented this morning that since um, patterns that match the stored priors in the network um, are much more easily classifiable uh, than um, face scrambled patterns that do not match any past experience of the system, that suggests a little bit that the classifier looks at something that the brain also looks at something because um, it's much more difficult for for the brain to to decode and to to remember um, face scrambled images. It's, it's virtually impossible. They can't. Uh, while they do perform very well on, on patterns that match stored knowledge, and, mm -hmm. and classifiers do the same. The linear classifiers that we use, it's a Bayesian classifier, or uh, we usually you have linear kernels. We didn't do much with nonlinear classifiers, which would be, I think, very interesting because there must be information in higher order correlations in these in these time series. But this has not been looked for at all. Thank you very much, Wolf. Thank you. Next question is coming from Jinani. Jinani, I'm inviting you on the screen, please. We have a delay a little bit. That's right. <laughs> um, now it seems. Hello. Yes, we have Jinani. Hello, Jinani. Hi, I like to, like to ask a question that uh, you mentioned in your talk that after we present uh, the animal with a sequence of stimulus, 
yeah. that uh, during the resting state, there's a replay of the stimulus that was presented uh, most often. Yeah. So how long will it take to decay this activity and come to a baseline activity without any interference of the stimulus? Uh, we, we don't know. We haven't done this experiment. Okay. Um, we haven't uh, we haven't looked whether there is a fading memory for these um, these places. We suppose that the repeated presentation activates the classical LTP LTP mechanism at the synapse and and strengthens connections between nodes that have frequently been coactivated by this particular pattern. Okay. Uh, but we don't know how long it lasts. Um, also, these experiments have to be done under, under more controlled conditions. It would be nice to have the animal behave and tell us um, what it remembered and whether those patterns that are better remembered are replaced uh, preferentially. All this is very early days, we don't know yet. Okay, okay. thank you. <laughs> Um, thank you. Our next question is coming from Evie. Uh, Evie, I am uh, asking you to come on the screen. We have a little delay again. <laughs> I, I see the question. In, in recurrent networks, what does learning look like mechanistically? Thinking about higher cognition, like learning a language or math. Yeah, uh, there are very interesting experiments in language learning. Um, I can cite uh, evidence that David Pepper has brought forth that if you, uh, well, language is a, is a sequential process. So uh, there's a continuous stream of, of, of noise, of vowels. Hello, hello, Amy. And it has to be segmented. This is so important. You, uh, like in visual perception, you have to segment the in order to make sense out of it. Language, you have to segment an acoustic stream of, of sounds. And they showed that if you do, and this is passive learning, it is not supervised, it's both subject to a, a stream of, um, of vowels uh, that obey certain statistics so that chunking becomes possible. The same way as, as children learn, um, they, they have to start to sequence and they have to recognize um, chunks that occur very frequently. And so adult people can be exposed to synthetic languages or to a language that they don't understand, like the Westerners with Chinese. And then it turns out that with statistical learning, um, they start to um, segment the frequently occurring uh, combinations of vowels. And this goes along with an observatory patterning of the, the neuronal activity, uh, which are from MEG and ECOC data. And it turns out that, um, let's assume there is a chunk that, um, yeah, you have segmented, uh, made, made a large bracket first. And then the oscillation is in, in, in one hertz. But then if you learn to subdivide it, it goes into two hertz, and then it goes into four hertz. Great. And so how does it work? Uh, we don't know. It's, it's, it must be some change in the synaptic rates of the recurrent connections, probably recurrent network as well in the auditory cortex. And then it changes the, the sequence sensitivity of the network. Okay, so is it correct to um, imagine it as if the, the networks are monitoring more or less constantly? So I'm a neural linguist, so fundamentally I'm actually very familiar with the parsing both in the auditory and the visual domain because I work with sign languages. So there's continuous monitoring for information density in the signal, and the learning happens uh, around the peaks such that to be able to parse the signal. And that's what learning happens. Okay, thank you. I was really intrigued after your talk this morning. 
Thank you. Really appreciate it. Have a nice day. So we have a comment from Siddhartha. Um, the mention is great question about decay. Wondering what the cells are doing before any stimulus. Are they silent? No, the, the networks are, are, are permanently active. Um, if they were only activated as a response in the response to affluent signals, it would take much too long uh, to get the communications uh, done between the nodes. Now the network is constantly active, and the activity that it displays is, is very, very high dimensional. It's uh, in the awake brain close to criticality. So a little bit more of excitation and it would go into chaos, would bifurcate into chaos, or would become epileptic. So it's just below the threshold of criticality. And it, it's this spatial temporal pattern of ongoing spontaneous activity that in some sort um, harbors all the latent priors, priors in the system. Um, it's superimposed information that is um, the envelope is, is the spontaneous activity. And as I showed this morning, it's, it's certain patterns have been overlearned, have been imprinted very, very frequently. Then they, they, they become so dominant in, in the spontaneous activity, the correlation structure that corresponds to these uh, patterns, then pops out spontaneously also. But I think under normal conditions, the spontaneous activity hoovers around very high dimensional and unless there's a, if there's a stimulus then this dimensionality is suddenly reduced so there's evidence that the dimensionality is, is dropping down there's more coherence the correlation structures become more succinct and apparently the better the match between the sensory evidence and the stored priors which are in the latest significance of these connections uh, the faster this products and the more succinct the resulting correlation pattern and therefore it is can be classified more easily. So to me it sometimes looks a little bit of course it's not quantum physics, but if as if spontaneous activity where the superposition of a lot of wave functions and then comes to the evidence and then one collapses. Whether it's attractive dynamics or something different, I think you don't know yet. Uh, thank you. No, I mean, uh, that, that's always a curious thing. Like, what is a grid cell or place cell doing, or any kind of cell that is you know, participating in any uh, or any kind of activity? Like, uh, is it like a top down functionality? Like, is it the, is the you know, a baseline activity the top down functionality, like what the brain is modeling, and then a new signal comes in and then it moves a bit, it adjusts. Uh, so, are we seeing more like uh, the world is more like the top down world, what, what we predict the world should be? The noise is the, 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 the voice, the, the sound is very, very poor. Maybe you, oh, I'm so sorry. Can you say it again a bit, a bit more slowly? No, okay, sorry. Uh, what I meant was, uh, I say slowly, is that um, is the recurrent activity corresponding to some kind of a top down view of the world? Like the brain is predicting continuously, like this is what the world is like, and a yeah. new signal comes in and then it shifts a bit. So, um, how much of how much what is importance given to like something a new a new signal and how that is incorporated? Yeah, well, all, all this is, is fits very well into the concept of predictive coding um, because you have to consider that um, well the data I showed today was from from V one and V four so very peripheral levels of visual system but all these super granular layers in each of these areas they receive an enormous amount of feedback connections from higher cortical areas, also from the supergranular layers. Um, it's, it's like um, many, many liquids that are coupled reciprocally, and they harbor different priors of different uh, order. So in higher cortical areas, you, you have, uh, nobody has looked for it actually is interesting. Uh, there is virtually no anatomical studies on um, selective recurrent connections in higher cortical areas, uh, whether they are specific, whether they connect preferential nodes that are frequently coactivated. 
But if the same principle occurs in higher areas, it would mean that there is chunking of, of complex constellations of features occurring in higher levels through the same principles. And, and this is that projected. So in, in, in very short time, um, I would assume that combustion velocities are five, six milliseconds at maximum from top down projections um, that even the peripheral area would know very, very quickly whether what it has offered mm -hmm. to the higher areas makes sense for them. Um, okay, let me so admit. Um, I think that we, we are little, um, there may be a paradigm shift in, in considering the nervous system as a, a bottom up stream with feed forward loops that go up to, to higher order areas, like in the visual system, the IT cortex and temporal cortex. Then the result is, is computed and then it's back propagated to do something. Um, probably in reality, this is a simultaneous process. This is a ping pong forward and backwards instantly. Everybody interacting with everybody else. Um, it's much more connected um, than we have been thinking previously. One evidence is that if you do imagery, if you imagine a visual pattern, uh, a letter or something, and if you have trained the classifier uh, to decode this from the visual cortex, you can also train a classifier to decode it from auditory cortex. So this uh, it seems as if information were everywhere in different formats and decodable. So, again, something we haven't grasped so far. Uh, this is this extremely dense interconnectivity that makes that if you, if you rattle somewhere um, in, in, along a stream, it will immediately be seen and heard by, by all the others. A couple of milliseconds. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. I, I actually had another question, but I don't want to take up other people's questions, but maybe I can come later. I posted another question, if you see, um, on, on the listing of, of the different themes, but uh, maybe I, I can wait on that. I was just curious about the striatum and the cortex and the thalamus, like if there are mixing that's also happening with the dorsal and the stream, and that, if that's the purpose of the very connectivity, but um, I, I can do that later. Yeah. Thalamus again, a riddle. Um, we know that there are about 10 times more fibers coming from visual cortex to the specific lung relay nucleus, the lateral significant nucleus in total vision. The same is the case for, for auditory system. But we don't know what these effects do. Um, we don't see very much effect by cooling and activating cortex optogenetically and, and probing the responses in the thalamus in the specific thalamic nucleus. Um, there's very little effect, a little bit more facial response, a little bit more inhibition, but that can't be what this huge fiber track is doing. So, again, something we ignore. I knew myself how I speak. Thank you. Uh, so, next we have a question from Max Garagagni. I am going to invite you on the screen. Ah. Yeah, this was the question on on the limitations of uh, deep learning networks, and I, I had in my slide that uh, they are not particularly generative. And uh, the question was um, why I thought this was the case. Um, well, the answer is. Ah, here you are. Hello. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that um, they have difficulties to be uh, to be creative. Um, so, if uh, to, to to generalize from something they have learned before, and then um, to to do pattern completion, they can do it if they have learned a huge amount of similar patterns, then they can guess what might be there if it's secluded. 
but a, a recurrent network because of the associativity of these networks. Like, that's much better, of course. Um, and and what, what these networks can do is uh, to really be creative, to connect uh, two contents that may be um, in two dynamical spaces, in two attractive spaces, that they may fuse. So the formerly unbound may suddenly get bound, which I don't see happening in a creed forward network, or does it? Are you, sorry, sorry, are you saying uh, bound dynamically or...? or bound dynamically, to resonance or any other phenomenon that, that you get uh, if you have a nonlinear dynamic system with many interacting nodes. Thank you. Our next question is from Cengiz Bunai. Cengiz, go ahead. Yeah. I was wondering, uh, I'm actually sitting next to Anka, so I'll just use her microphone. And I was just wondering, like, you, you made a good point about liquid state machines, and I know them from before, and they're very powerful. And I, I definitely agree with you that they can fill a gap that deep learning nets have been occupying. Um, everyone thinks deep learning nets is the, is the answer to everything, but we know that they're very simplistic. So do you have any intuition on, like, what kind of practical um, advances we should expect from liquid state machines that can, like, perform better than deep learning nets? Well, um, I'm not a specialist in, in, in liquid computing. Um, I have an intuition of what the systems do. Uh, they have this interesting property of fading memory that they can superimpose. Therefore, um, information that is derived from sequentially present similarly, which is for deep learning networks not so easy because they don't have time as a coding dimension. Um, but I think what nature did is take advantage of this possibility to transform low dimensional um, input patterns into very high dimensional dynamic um, states, uh, separate them in this high dimensional space, which makes for better classification, also by some invariance properties. And of course, nature went one step further. It doesn't use a liquid. It uses um, a very unisotropic and coupled <laughs> liquid. So it's not homogeneously coupled, but uh, all the coupling connections, they are learned and they are specifically tuned. So you can store a lot of information um, because of this unisotropic coupling. So liquid is, uh, is isotropic. Um, also, nature can change the viscosity of this liquid because uh, it can change the space constants of uh, the propagation of traveling waves as a function of excitability control. Um, it can change the temporal interval over which the liquid can integrate, the cortex can integrate. So it uses this basic principle, I think, but we find it considerably that they're making it inhomogeneous, anisotropic, and modifiable. Very, very interesting points. I'll, I'll think about this. Thank you. Now I can't hear you. Yeah, so Cengiz was just thanking you. Um, and he says the, the points are very interesting, and he'll think about them. Um, okay. <laughs> so our next question comes from uh, Giwan Lee, if I pronounce the name correctly. If not, I apologize. Uh, I'm going to invite you on the screen, Giwan. If you want to come, press yes, otherwise press no. Yeah, I see the question. The question was, um, whether um, I, I briefly mentioned on the floor, um, LFP measurements that one can also use local field potentials in order to decode what the stimulus is. Yeah, um, 
what one usually sees if one presents a stimulus, there's this collapse of the high dimensional spontaneous activity into something more coherent. And depending on the quality of the match between the evidence and the stored priors, um, you may get quite strong oscillatory activity uh, in the high frequency range, usually addresses gamma between 50 and 80 hertz or so. So what one can do is if one has recordings from 50 different nodes, um, take the power of the oscillations in this frequency range and use this instead of the discharge of the neurons and train a classifier on the power distribution that is produced by the various nodes. And that also works. And it, it's, it shows the same thing. It works better if the patterns that you want to classify correspond to the stored trials, if they are taken from natural experience um, rather than scrambled images or, uh, yeah. So um, we see potential is, of course, just an epiphenomenon of uh, it's an average of synaptic activity, mainly reflecting uh, excitatory postsynaptic potentials on dendritic compartments that can form a dipole. Um, but as we, as we said before with Claudio Mirazzo, um, classifiers pick up everything. And so whatever you feed to them, they, they may come up with a result. I don't think that the brain reads field potentials. Um, the brain reads spikes. Does that capture your answer, your question? Um, it seems that he is not here. Uh -huh. <laughs> and we don't have any questions uh, in the chat, but I do have a question for you. It's of a kind of different nature. Um, what advice you would give to the young researchers? What directions should they take and what will be good for them to get the research, good research started? What should they start with? Where should they look at? Uh, any advice for young people? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> they will have to become multidisciplinary. Um, my deepest regret is that I did not learn my maths properly at an academic level. Uh, because modern neuroscience is, is bound to use sophisticated mathematical methods uh, in order to understand the language of the brain and we are far from understanding the codes which the brain actually uses. So we need, we need people who both know about uh, the biological underpinnings of the brain. So basic knowledge in neuroscience, I think is indispensable, even if what is a very, very um, cunning computational neuroscientist, um, because they, these models and simulations, they have to be grounded in neurobiological evidence if they were to contribute to neuroscience. Uh, if you just want to produce machines that do intelligent stuff, then this is not necessary. But I think what we really need is to have laboratories in which we have um, physicists dealing with complex systems, with nonlinear systems, mathematicians who know the formalisms, uh, computer scientists, and neuroscientists who do the experiments. And both sides have to communicate more and more with each other, which means that one needs at least to understand the language of the respective other to the extent that one can explain the problems one has in a language that the respective other can understand. And this is, is a reciprocal process. And we see more and more curricula of, of students who started in neuroscience and then they took computational courses, uh, they learned to simulate, uh, they learned their maths, and then they return into neuroscience labs. And vice versa, we see neuroscientists who, um, or yeah, computational people who started off in mathematics and physics and they end up in, in the neuroscience environment. So the combination of the two I think is indispensable. Okay. 
thank you. Thank you very much. That was very, uh, very nice and detailed. <laughs> that gives me a lot of ideas, actually. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, that's for me personally. <laughs> so we have uh, we have another question. So I'm gonna mm -hmm. take uh, Jonas Newhofer question. Uh, I'm gonna invite you on the screen, Jonas. Feel free to press yes or no. Ah. this is the question is from Jonas Neuhofer. Um, if notes that are strongly cut, I hear you. Thank you. You might be well, formulate your own question. I was just about to read it. Um, so, sorry, I'm just. I'm having really bad audio quality, I noticed. So <laughs> yeah, we know this problem. Like so I... well. hmm. Yeah, too much difficulties, too complicated settings. Okay, so my question is just, you mentioned that oscillations are important for uh, this, this reactivations of the whole assemblies. So why are these oscillations important? Shouldn't they also, um, these reactivations appear if it doesn't oscillate? Yeah, um, I think this field has changed a lot in, in, in the last decades. Um, in the beginning, when these oscillations had been discovered, everybody had been assuming that we, we have to do with, uh, with, with constant sine wave oscillations and that where the Arnold tongue applies, that if you have coupled oscillators, so the, the, Muramoto model uh, that you get into phase synchrony and so uh, in the meantime we know that we should consider these local circuits as damp oscillators uh, that are driven by by the input they get and if they if, if you couple uh, two of these damped oscillators which have a similar resonance frequency because they well, the columns look the same if they are strongly driven, they engage into these uh, periodic activity patterns and then they entrain each other and try to phase lock. And the evidence that, that we see is, for example, that you get uh, zero phase synchronous firing between neurons that are located in two different hemispheres. And these neurons are only reciprocally coupled, they don't get any um, common direct input. They interact through these reciprocal connections, which go through the corporate collation. And then one can show that if one cuts the corporate collation, they can no longer do this. And the, the riddle that is posed by this phenomenon is that how can you get zero phase synchrony given that the coupling has substantial conduction delays? And if you have nodes that are inclined to oscillate and to resonate, you can get the zero phase um, synchrony, uh, which you wouldn't be able to establish otherwise. Um, despite the fact Could that the reciprocal connections are delaying. And the evidence from simulation studies is that you get zero phase synchrony as long as the coupling delays do not exceed one quarter cycle of the oscillation um, period. And this is very important because for heavy learning, for example, you need very precise temporal contingency of inputs. So if you have to integrate something from very different places in the brain that comes together at some place where you want to have your heavy synapses work and change you have to make this input somehow coincident. So how do you get uh, coincident activity in a system that is coupled through delay all the time? And there, oscillations may help. Uh, also, pacemaker neurons may help because they put a temporal frame around the activity. So the oscillations per se do not have a function, but the propensity to oscillate allows you for resonance phenomena 
uh, allows you for all the formalism that you get with public oscillators. They can train each other. They can uh, they synchronize with delay or without delay. Um, so it introduces space, if you like, as a coding space. It is quite interesting. Hmm. Just there, Christian, could you explain what you mean with zero phase hmm? frequency? Or what is zero phase frequency you mentioned multiple times? Phase synchrony. Wait, is my microphone that bad? Well, if, if you have two oscillators, <laughs> this. Um, they, they, they can oscillate completely independently, they can phase lock, and they can do this with the phase lag. Mm -hmm. so, and sometimes they do it with zero phase lag. They yeah, yeah. really go together. And this is a little bit curious because they are coupled to delay, so how can that happen? But if there is reciprocity, this can happen. There are so wouldn't this, wouldn't this mean that then two different concepts, which um, have somehow the same frequency, which also fire correlately and form a new assembly? Well, they, they, they entrain each other. Um, they so the, yeah. Um, so in, in, the, in the visual cortex, for example, um, a recent discovery by, actually it's an older discovery, <coughs> by Charlie Gray and McCormick, who already described what they call chattering cells. These are cells which have pacemaker currents, and <coughs> they chop. Uh, they, they, they fire like choppers, so they already pass time. Um, and they are also found in the visual cortex of monkeys, um, they are inseminated into the networks, maybe as stabilizers for some rhythmic um, processes. And then you have all these local circuits, which are um, this is recurrent feedback, essentially, that produces uh, oscillation, or the that makes a circuit like to get entrained into an oscillation that corresponds to the resonance frequency of the circuit. I'm sorry, I understand only half of it because my audio quality is bad, but I, I at least got some interesting ideas and I can watch the, the answer again. Yeah, we can continue but, by writing if you like. Um, the sound is very bad. I, I have difficulties to understand what you say, but it's okay. Okay, so then thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so okay. I'm inviting Claudio back to the screen. He has one more question. Could you make me leave? Uh, yes, you should um, in a minute. It takes a minute. It's called technology. <laughs> <laughs> So Claudio was asking about the possibility to realize predictive coding in recurrent networks or in, in reservoir computing um, as a way to compare bottom-up with top-down inputs and compute an error and whether these two proposals are compatible. Um, yes, I think if, if, the, if the stored knowledge is in in the weight distributions of the recurrent connections within the area, but also, of course, concerning the recurrent connections from higher order areas that back project into any of these areas. Um, the activity that is maintained in these areas is sort of the envelope of, of all the stored 
idiosyncrasies in these networks. And if then bottom-up input comes with sensory evidence, um, it will shift the dynamics of these systems into a particular, usually lower dimensional state, which is in itself already the substate, the correlation structure of the substate is the result of a matching operation between sensory evidence and uh, stored information or stored priors. Is this what Cloud you wanted to know? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Sounds right. <laughs> um, so Guillaume also comes back with another question. Um, how much do you think memory is local or non-local? If they are local to certain cells, why exactly do you think specific memory? Well, I think this is... <laughs> so this is... Sorry. <laughs> now you hear, Claudio. Yeah, no, no, that, that's correct. I mean, I, I was wondering because the rest of our computing uses this uh, classifier at the output layer, but uh, predictive coding uses both input and uh, from the top down and bottom up at the same simultaneously, but your response is, is very right. I mean, you might have most yeah. of them in a recurrent network. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's really yeah. a very good answer. Thank you very much, Walter. Okay. I hope that the immediate person somewhere in sooner. Huh? Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. So the next question was From uh, the yeah. one on memory and distributedness. Right. Right. Well, I think it's memory is an extremely distributed uh, phenomenon, and there's there's currently a debate if, for example, one one does imagery, one imagines a visual pattern where this pattern is stored, and uh, the fact that one can decode this pattern um, from activity in primary visual cortex as well as from prefrontal cortex as well as from parietal cortex. Um, yeah. To determine where the, where the memory traces are is very difficult. What, what one certainly knows is that they propagate um, across many different areas. Um, the classical assumption is that working memory, for example, is realized in prefrontal cortex in certain parts of it, and that there is a frontal parietal network that plays ping pong um, and the stores, uh, the, the working memory contents. I think the evidence that memories are maintained by circulating activity is no longer very good. There is more evidence that um, there are lasting changes in synaptic gain <clears throat> that have a decay time constant in, in the case of working memory, so they don't last forever. Um, and that these synaptic changes that must occur at many, many, many synapses at the same time in a graded way um, somehow influence the dynamics of the system so that the correlation patterns that they generate correspond to a particular memory content. But uh, so far, we don't know very well um, the neuronal correlate of an engram. We know from studies in the hippocampus for example, that <clears throat> certain cells rather than others are engaged in maintaining spatial memory or in maintaining um, memories of, of uh, established during fear conditioning. Um, not all cells participate. Certain cells uh, get more activated during memory encoding and recall than others. Um, and it has also been shown that one can reactivate certain memories by selectively activating um, those so-called engram cells. But what the format of, of the memory is, is as cryptic as the format of all other neuronal codes. Um, yeah. You, you realize there are so many things we don't know. Thank you. Um, we have a last question and we have uh, about five minutes. <laughs> so a short answer. <laughs> yeah. The question comes from Chang Sum Kim. Um, 
and it relates to the free energy principle, which suggests the brain minimizes such prediction errors. Uh, and he wants uh, a comment from you on the possible connections of uh, your theory and observa observations to the FEP theory. Yeah. Um, well, I think um, when a stimulus comes and uh, you have this collapse of these very high dimensional spontaneous activity patterns into uh, substates that are more coherent, uh, have a lower dimensionality. Um, this is equivalent with reducing um, free energy. Now, the, the free energy theory is formulated in such general terms um, that it's very hard to, to tackle experimentally. But um, there's certainly a reduction um, in free energy when such matching operations do occur um, and as I alluded to, there's the possibility that um, activity that matches very uh, sensory evidence or input that matches very well the stored priors, rather than increasing the rates very much, um, it produces um, low dimensional coherent activation of the um, nodes that participate in this. Um, that code for these matching signals. Um, now the question is how this activity is propagated forward. Um, somehow, not only the prediction error must be propagated forward in order to reduce um, free energy, but also the matching signals must be propagated forward because what you want actually is to perceive what matches, what you expected. Um, so it's possible that there are dual pathway, one for that signals with rate increases the error, and the other one that signals with uh, increased coherence and synchrony uh, what matches. And it could very well be that very well synchronized activity from a lower area um, doesn't propagate much further because it drives very strongly the inhibitory circuits in the next processing stage, which then cut off um, the transmission of these signals in, into the next uh, recurrent network layers. Also unknown, unfortunately, um, the predictive coding field still struggles with the question, is only the error propagated or is only the match propagated or are both propagated? Um, I wouldn't know. I would be able to decide. But certainly, there is, it, all those ideas are compatible with the reduction of the free energy. Thank you very much, Paul. And um, if there are any more questions, please post them on Discord. We, I can compile a list of them and send them via email to Wolf for later answers. Um, the channel is K1-Singer. Uh, thank you everyone for coming and let's thank our speaker. The, the talk was very interesting and eye-opening to me personally. Um, and uh, nice to meet you, by the way. <laughs> I can't see you. I know, we have a little glitch in here. My uh, my sound and all my controls have disappeared. Christine has no touch on anything. We are kind of in uh, in a black hole right now. We try to survive, <laughs> but we made it somehow. <laughs> it's been an adventurous day. I'm sorry for all these technicalities, <laughs> Wolf. Yeah, yeah. 